Well, good morning, everyone. It's nice to be back at Southgate in the pulpit. It's been a few weeks. We were gone uh, in South Africa and Zambia, and uh, we're hoping to give some kind of a report back on that trip at some point. And uh, then last week we had Rob Jackson with us, so it's been a few weeks, and uh, I'm glad to be back and glad to be sitting in this chair and uh, glad to be able to bring the Word of God to you this morning. How are you doing? Are you doing well? Are you struggling? How are you doing in your walk with Christ? It's been a while since I've seen you, so I want to ask that question and say, how are you doing this morning? You will notice on the screen that we're starting a new series this morning, and I've entitled it More Like Jesus. And its basis comes from Romans chapter 8, verse 29, that says, For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. He predestined us to be conformed to the image of his son. So maybe the better question is not, how are you doing? Maybe the better question is, how much more do you look like Jesus today than you did yesterday? And how much more will you look like Jesus tomorrow than you do today? You know, sometimes there's a whole lot of things that we could talk about in church. There's a whole lot of different subjects that we could address in church, and we've tried to be faithful to the preaching the whole counsel of God. We don't shy away from the difficult things in the Scriptures. We try to address issues that are relative and related to where people are at. But at the end of the day, there is nothing more practical, there is nothing more important than all of us becoming more like Jesus. You say you want to be a better parent. You can't be a better parent until you're more like Jesus. You want to be a better spouse. You can't be a better spouse until you're more like Jesus. You want to be a better son or daughter with your mom and dad. You can't be a better son or daughter unless you're more like Jesus. You want to be a better teacher at school. Fill in the gap. I'm going to go down the road with that. you got to be more like Jesus. It is the purpose to which God has called you if you are a Christ follower. He doesn't save us from our sin, translate us from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light, and then just leave us there and lets us do whatever we want to do. He translates us into the kingdom of of light so that we can become more like his precious son who lived and died and was raised again so that we might have not just physical life but spiritual life. So the operative question over the next few weeks as we launch into this series is, are you more like Jesus? Are you growing in your relationship with him? And what I hope to do in this series is to outline a few items that are of strategic importance for our church, because as we think about moving into our business meeting in December, this is the ultimate goal of our church, is that we would all become more like Jesus. This is more important than budgets. This is more important than buildings. This is more important than parking lots. This is more important than anything that we do. If we are not becoming more like Jesus, we are failing as a church. And if God is not using us to help other people become more like Jesus, then we are failing as a church because this is absolutely critical. And Paul said in Romans 8, 29, the verse that I just read, it says, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined. This has been a part of God's plan from before the creation of the world that you fill in your name, fill in your blank, that you would become like Jesus oh, but we wrestle with that because we're not like him, are we? We do our own thing a lot. 
We are imperfect and we are broken and we are fallen and the Bible says that we are depraved and we are sinful. But after that glorious moment of salvation, boom, God sets us on a course that's going to make us become more like Jesus. And we can't do it by ourselves. We need the church to be able to do that. I think it's time for me to bring Calvin and Hobbes back into the equation. She says, all right, let's go to bed. And what does he say? I'm not going to bed. Oh, yes, you are. Move it. Don't be so dysfunctional, Mom. I've got a new entry for our list of words that get a reaction. (laughs) Children, I do not recommend that you call your parents dysfunctional. Although it might be true, don't say it to them, okay? I've put together a group of pastors that were trying to work through planning a conference on uh, racial reconciliation next year. And as we've been brainstorming, talking about what our purpose is as a group coming together, and this group is growing, we just had a few more people join us this last week, and as this group is growing, we're, we're wrestling through what are the values that we hold as believers that's going to speak to this issue of racial reconciliation What is our purpose? What are we trying to accomplish? We're not trying to replace the church. We're not trying to be a parachurch. We're trying to come alongside of churches to help them intentionally engage in this discussion. But as we've been talking about this subject, we recognize something very similar to what Calvin uh, recognized here with his mom. There are certain words that as soon as you mention in the discussion of racial reconciliation that shut people off. Some of those words may shut off a particular group of people, but really excite another group of people in a positive way. And there are words that would do the opposite to each of those groups. You just mention some of these words and instantly you've lost your audience because there are some words that get a reaction from people, right? Even in churches, there are some words that just get a reaction from folks, You mention the word giving, and all of a sudden people are like. (coughs) You mention the word evangelism, and there are people that are like. (coughs) Yeah. You mention the word pornography, and you have people that put their head down in shame. There are all sorts of words that get a reaction. And yet there's this fascinating thing that we see in the book of John in the New Testament because the Apostle John is writing an account of Jesus Christ. And different from Matthew, Mark, and Luke in the New Testament, John begins his book, this book that's going to explain the good news of who Jesus is, and he begins with a name for Jesus that is unlike any other name that we see in the Scriptures. In fact, if you want to talk about uh, words that get reactions, just mention the name Jesus in the public sphere, and you will see a lot of people go, (laughs) You heard the story when we were uh, headed to, to South Africa a few weeks ago. You guys heard the story, and I know Pastor Brian shared the story uh, when he was preaching that Sunday, because I was watching online while, while we were gone. Um, but you heard that Sarah got thrown up on on the first plane ride, right? We got separated in our seats, and uh, I was actually s- supposed to sit in the back of the plane. She was supposed to sit in the front of the plane. And uh, this guy, a long story, he was just an interesting guy. He, we saw him in the waiting room, and he was talking loud on his cell phone, and he was boasting about, yeah, I'm going to fly my mom, and she's going to be business class, and I'm paying for it. And I'm, my family, I'm bringing my brother and his family. Uh, they're not going to fly in business class, but I'm paying for that too. And he's just really boastful, and he's really loud and obnoxious. And as we're getting on the plane, that's the person that she was going to be sitting next to. And so she saw that it was in the bulkhead, so it had a little more space for me. And I'm looking at this guy. And I'm like, yeah, she doesn't want to sit there. I said, I'll sit there. And she's like, yeah, I want you to sit there. I'll go to the back of the plane. So she goes to the back of the plane, and she gets thrown up on at the end of the flight. And that's a story in and of itself, because there were no bags strategically located to cover. And then when the woman went like this, it just goes like this. And 
Sarah had the in-flight magazine and she's taking cover like this. But the good news in that story is that while my wife is getting puked on in the back of the plane, I had the opportunity to share the gospel with the guy in the front of the plane. And he told me that he was, I didn't have to ask him about this. I just, I just said, you know, tell me a little about yourself. I said, where are you from? He actually is from Dayton, but he lives in California. He lives in San Francisco. And he said, I'm a liberal. Okay. Talk about words that get a reaction, right? <laughs> and then he goes on, he starts to talk about some other things. And I'm starting to piece a few things together in my mind and I'm making an assumption. And then all of a sudden he comes out and he says, yep, I'm in San Francisco. He says, I'm, I'm a liberal. And he says, and I'm a homosexual. I'm a gay man. And then he turned to me and he says, what do you do? <laughs> I'm so glad you asked. <laughs> and then for the next probably 25, 30 minutes, we're just talking. And I've shared, I shared my testimony of how I came to know Christ as my Savior. And I went into the gospel. And then he's like, yeah. He says, well, you know, I've had you know, these bad experiences with churches and whatever. And he says, and I believe this. And I said, okay. I said, how did you come to that conclusion? I said, what standard are you using to measure whether your belief is right or it's wrong? And we had a great time. And it was a great discussion. And at the end of it, he said, uh, or I asked him, I said, how can I pray for you? And he said, well, he says, you can pray that I'm happy. Okay. I said, I will pray that you're happy. I said, but I will say that I'm going to pray that you, that you find Jesus because you can't have happiness without him. Okay, thank you. Have a great, have a nice life. And we separated ways. But it's interesting how words get a reaction from people. Specific words stir up emotions and, and, and anger and hostility. And sometimes words stir up emotions of love and joy and elation and excitement and happiness. And when John starts his gospel in chapter 1, if you got your Bibles, I want you to go there with me. John chapter 1, it's interesting how he starts his gospel. Matthew begins with a genealogy that, that talks about all of the people tracing the lineage of Jesus. And in John chapter 1, he says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. The power of a Word to bring about emotion to bring about some type of a response. And John begins his writing by saying, in the beginning was the Word. I want you to stand up with me and I want you to say this with me if you believe it. You're going to have to listen fast this morning because we got a lot of ground to cover. And I'm going to try my best to keep you in your pew so that you don't fall off of your pew. But let's dive into the Word together. This is my Bible. It is the very Word of God. It is true and without error. It has authority over all peoples, in all places, in all times. Today, my heart is ready to submit to God's authority. By His grace, I will apply His Word to my life. I stand on His truth for His glory. I can never be the same in Jesus' name. Here's what I want you to pray this morning before we begin. I want you to pray this prayer. I want you to say, Lord, show me what my relationship is to your word. And maybe you could qualify that a little bit more specifically and say, Lord, show me the condition of my relationship with your word. You pray that, then I'll pray, and then we're going to dive into this together this morning. Oh, Father, I thank you for this day and for this time that we can be gathered together. And I pray in these brief moments that we have in your word that you would speak powerfully to us through your word. Lord, I'm not looking for an exercise in ritual. We're not here just because it's the thing that we're supposed to do. We're here because we want you to speak to us through your word. And so, Father, I pray that you would do that, and I pray that you would do that in such a way that we would understand what our condition is before you, 
and the condition of our relationship to your word, and that you by your spirit would open our eyes to the change that we need to bring about in our life so that we can be more like Jesus. And I pray this for his glory, in his name, amen. You may be seated. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. All things, verse 3, were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Oh, and here's the glorious verse, as if the other ones have not been glorious enough. The one that we're going to celebrate on December 25th, the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Amen and amen. As we think about this concept of being more like Jesus, we got to understand a few things about who Jesus is. And this morning, we're going to look at four statements about Jesus that really responds to this question, what was Jesus' relationship to God's Word? Because I asked you to pray the prayer, what is your relationship to God's Word this morning? More specifically, what is the condition of your relationship to God's Word this morning? And I want us to see how this question is answered in the life of Jesus because it has ramifications for us today if we say that we want to be more like Jesus. And so the question is, what was Jesus' relationship to God's Word? And of course, the first answer to that question is pretty simple. We see it here in John chapter 1, and that is that Jesus is God's Word. John refers to him as the Word, and we know that he's referring to Jesus here, even though in this specific passage he doesn't mention Jesus, because when you get to the end of the book of John, and we're going to have that verse pop up on the screen towards the end of this message, in John chapter 20, verse 31, it says, these things are written that you might know, that you might believe in Jesus as the Son of God. And so we refer everything backwards to chapter 1 because of this theme that he is focusing on the life of Jesus, and he begins in the very beginning of his book. He says, in the beginning was the Word. And it's interesting that he uses this word because in the Greek, the word is logos. And in this particular time, the word logos had an idea to it. It was more of a, a sort of a theory. It was more of a, a sort of a spirit concept. It was more of a sort of an intellectual concept about divine essence and being. But he uses the word logos in a, in a different way because when we get to verse 14 and it says the word became flesh, God did something very unique in the incarnation. He put on human flesh and became a man. There is no other religion in the world where God became man. And he became man for the sole purpose of redeeming us. And saving us from our sin. Saving us from the condemnation that our sin deserves. And God knew that only he could remove it. And so Jesus becomes the divine Logos. He becomes the word of God to man. In Jesus, God is making a definitive statement. He's saying, this is who I am. Oh, that is a glorious truth, isn't it? This is who I am. Jesus is God's word. And when we look at verses 1 and 2, it says, In the beginning 
was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. We see that Jesus is not just God's Word, but He is God's eternal Word. Jesus existed before He became a baby, right? It's not like the Godhead all of a sudden added another member at the Incarnation, at the Christmas story. Jesus existed before time and space. He was with God in the beginning. He was God. He is the eternal Word. And the way that you see this statement break down, it says, in the beginning the Word existed because the Word was there at the very beginning. John 1.1, 1, 1, very much similar, is very similar to Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Jesus existed before the beginning. In fact, one of the ways that we might be able to understand verse 1 here is that before the beginning began, there was Jesus. Before the beginning started, there was Jesus. He existed, and he was with God. But not only was he with God, but he was God. Oh, and you start talking about these words, and these words make people angry in our world today. Jesus, he was a good man, he was a good teacher, but he was not God. Really? If he was not God, we're hopeless and we're helpless. But he existed. He was with God, and he was God. He was also the creative word. He's not just the eternal word, but he's the creative word. Look at verse 3. All things were made through who? Him. And without him was not anything made that was made. I like the way that that's worded in the English. Without him was not anything made that was made. I don't know about you, but I do like to make things. There are some things that I like to make. Popcorn is one of them, although I didn't make the popcorn. I just helped the process, right? And you've heard some of our horror stories about popcorn. I, when I was a kid, I liked to, to draw. I liked, to, I liked artistic things and um, got turned off of art because of an art teacher that I had. But I loved to draw when I was a kid. I loved to be creative. I still love a blank piece of paper and give me a blank piece of paper and let's create a whole lot of really cool new ideas and let's get after it. My wife doesn't like the blank sheet of paper. The blank sheet of paper makes her sweat, but she can take my page that I've filled with all of these creative things and she can take it and bring order to it and bring uh, just a systematic way of, of dealing with it and covering all the details. So we make a good team in that regard. But I like to be creative, but I don't have the power to create by speaking it. I don't have the power to say popcorn, and then boom, there's a bowl of popcorn. All right, let's go. I don't have the power to speak and say, ice cream, and all God's people said, and there's ice cream. But God has that power. He spoke the universe into existence. And it says that Jesus is not just God, and he was, he was not just with God, he was God, but he was the creative force because it says all things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. He's the creator, Jesus. Oftentimes we think of God the Father as the creator, but Jesus is God, and he is the full manifestation of the Godhead. Colossians and Hebrews talks about he's the exact representation of the God of God in human form. He was with God in the beginning and there was not anything made that Jesus didn't have a part in making. You look at the mountains, you look at the trees, you look at the ocean, you look at the animals, you look at your little pets that you have at home. Jesus did all of that. And he spoke it into existence. What an amazing God. He's not just the eternal word. He's the creative word. And he's not just the creative word, but he is the word of life. Look at verse 4. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not comprehended it. 
In another passage of Scripture over in 1 John, we have uh, the writer, as same writer as the Gospel of John. He starts off 1 John, and he says, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and have touched with our hands, concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest, and we've seen it, and testify to it, and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. And he's referring to Jesus. He said the life was made manifest, the word of life, this Jesus. We've touched him. We've seen him. He was real. And that's why John writes the books of the Bible that he writes because he's giving us information about who Jesus is. And Jesus is the Word of God. The living Word. The eternal Word. The creative Word. The Word of life. And in verse 14, our Christmas verse, He is the incarnate Word. Oh, I love that word incarnation. But more than I love the word incarnation, I love what the incarnation is that God became flesh and made his dwelling with us. I think we need to break out into some Christmas carols right now. What was Jesus' relationship to God's word? Jesus is God's word. He is the final statement about who God is. There will be no revelation that will come after Jesus that will explain to us more fully who God is. He is the final word. But the second way that Jesus related to God's word is found in Luke chapter 2, verses 40 to 52. And we're not going to read all of those verses there, but if you want to flip over there very quickly, we're going to look at a couple of them. And this primarily takes place when Jesus was a young boy in the incarnation. And we have to remember that every time we see Jesus in the scriptures, we're talking about somebody who was human, but somebody who was also God at the same time. And in verse 40 of Luke chapter 2, it says, The child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. And then Luke tells this story. His parents went to Jerusalem every year at the Feast of Passover, and when he was 12 years old, they went up according to the custom. And when the feast was ended, they were returning. The boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but his parents didn't know it. And when they did not find him, verse 45, they returned to Jerusalem searching for him. And after three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. And when his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said, Son, why have you treated us so? Behold, your father and I have been searching for you in great distress. And he said to them, Why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? Or some of our other translations say, I need to be about my father's business. And they did not understand the saying that he spoke to them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was submissive to them. And his mother treasured up all these things in her heart, and Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. One of the things that we see of how Jesus related to God's word, not only is he God's word, but he also studied God's word. And Wayne Grudem, in his book, Systematic Theology, in the very first chapter, when he starts talking about the Word of God, he he does a great job describing the different ways that the Word of God is referenced in the Scriptures. Sometimes it's referencing specifically the things that God says to an individual, the words of God, the the prophetic utterances that the, the prophets would speak. God's Word is Jesus, which is the first point that he makes, but then God's Word is also the revelation that he has given to us that has been written down. And one of the things that we have to understand that when we understand the Word of God and how the the phrase the Word of God is used in the Bible, if it's the prophetic utterances that the prophets were speaking to the people, it was the Word of God, and to disobey that was to disobey God himself. Jesus was the Word of God, and to disobey Jesus is to disobey God himself. And the Bible as the written Word of God, it is the Word of God, and to disobey the Bible is to disobey God himself. And Jesus demonstrated this submission to the Word, 
even though he was the word, and even though he was the one who spoke the universe into existence, and by virtue of 2 Timothy 3.16, through the power of the Holy Spirit, he is the one who inspired all of the books of the Bible to be written. It is his word. And as he was walking on the flesh, he manifested a submission to the written word of God. Why? Because he wrote it. He studied the Word of God. He listened to the teachers, this chapter says. He asked questions. And let me tell you something. We stop learning when we stop asking questions. He listened to the teachers. He asked questions. And because of that, the Scripture says that in his humanity, he increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. So, Jesus' relationship to the Word of God is, number one, He is the Word, but when He was walking on the planet, He studied God's Word. Right? But He also did something else with God's Word. He discerned it. Remember in Matthew chapter 4, when He was being tempted by Satan in the wilderness? How many of you remember that story? So, the Spirit of God takes him out into the wilderness. Satan comes onto the scene, and he begins to tempt Jesus. And the temptation that Satan brings to Jesus is for Jesus to, sh to take a shortcut to what God had intended. And Satan always wants us to take a shortcut. He always wants us to, to do away with God's Word and to do our own thing. And this was a test to prove that Jesus was God, because the Bible says that God can't be tempted for evil. The Bible says that Jesus was tempted in every way just as we were, yet was without what? Without sin. This was a test to prove and determine that Jesus in the flesh was God in the flesh. And when you look at this passage of Scripture, Jesus, not only did he study the Word, as we looked at previously, but he also is able to discern the Word, and he had to be discerning because when Satan tempted him... Um, Satan used the word with him, didn't he? I mean, Jesus' response to the temptation was, it is written. Basically, if we wanted to put it in our contemporary saying, when Jesus was being tempted by Satan, Jesus' response was, the Bible says this. The Bible says this. The Bible says this. And after the first temptation, Jesus, or Satan comes and says, if you're the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But Jesus answered, it's written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Oh, the devil says, okay, you're going to play that game? All right. He takes him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you're the son of God, throw yourself down. Now Satan says, for it is written. Oh, Satan quoting scripture. He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus said to him, again it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Satan quoting scripture, Jesus discerning that Satan wasn't speaking the truth, even though he was quoting scripture. How's that possible? Because the scripture is truth. But he was misapplying truth. He was misunderstanding truth. And you can't catch an error. You can't catch a lie unless you know the truth, right? When I worked as a bank teller, uh, as soon as I, I graduated from Cedarville, I was a broadcasting major, had trouble finding a job in my field, and I ended up working as a bank teller for about a year while I was waiting for my wife to graduate so that we could get married, although we didn't wait until she graduated. We got married anyway, but that's another story. And I'm sitting working at, the, at this bank, and they're putting me through training and uh, they want us to be able to spot counterfeits, but you know what? They didn't pull out counterfeit money for us to evaluate and to look at. They only gave us the real thing. And they said, you need to know the real thing so well that it will be so easy to spot a counterfeit. We don't need to explore all of the lies that are out there. All we need to do is know the truth because the truth will determine what is a lie. And Satan, as he's <laughs> tempting Jesus, Jesus quotes scripture, says the Bible says, and then he says, okay, you're going to play that game? Well, the Bible says this over here. And Jesus says, uh-uh, it's written here. 
you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Oh, we need to be discerning as believers. Jesus discerned God's word. Discernment is so important. See, dear, you can't believe everything you read. It says so right here on the internet. Oh, we need to be discerning when we're reading the internet. Not just in terms of the junk that we shouldn't be looking at, but in terms of the junk that people are saying and they're trying to pass it off as something that is, thus saith the Lord. Discernment is important. I love what Spurgeon said. He said, discernment is not a matter of simply telling the difference between what is right and wrong. Rather, it's the difference between right and almost right. Oh, it's easy to discern God's will when we're talking about something that the Bible speaks against compared to what the Bible affirms. But when we've got two things that are looking pretty good, that's when we really need discernment. Which one is the right thing? They look pretty close, but which one is the right thing? And Jesus, his relationship with the Word, he was the Word. He studied the Word. He discerned the Word. But the third thing that Jesus did, and this is point number four in the message, Jesus applied God's Word. And we could say from the Matthew 4 passage in the, the tempting in the wilderness that Jesus not only discerned God's Word, but he applied it. But there's other places in the Scripture where he also applied the Word of God. And one of those is found in uh, Mark chapter 12 uh, when some folks came to him and they were asking him some questions that uh, were of the spiritual nature, of a theological nature. The Sadducees, they came to him and they said there's... uh, And the Sadducees came to him who say that there is no resurrection... And they asked him a question saying, Teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies and leaves a wife but leaves no child, the man must take the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. So the Sadducees and the Pharisees were the two different religious camps, and the Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection. And of course, in Sunday school, we teach our kids they didn't believe in the resurrection. That's why they were called the Sadducees, because they were sad, you see. Right? You remember that from from Sunday school? They didn't believe in the resurrection, so they're trying to catch Jesus out, and they throw this scenario. Now, according to the law, if a brother dies, then the brother, uh, one of the brothers is supposed to marry, this, marry his wife and, you know, perpetuate the, the, the name and the seed of, of the brother. So they give this fictitious scenario where this brother dies, then he marries the wife, and then this brother dies, and he marries the wife, and this brother, and this brother, and this brother. Whose wife will she be in the resurrection? Oh, that's a conundrum. We caught him. He's not going to be able to figure this one out. Remember, he wrote the word. He is the word. And what is his response? He says in verse 24, Is this not the reason you are wrong because you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God? And he begins to give them some information about that particular scenario that they gave him. He was able to apply the word. And I don't ever want it to be said about us that we know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. Because in the scriptures is the power of God. Because it's the word of God. And so as we think about this, where we've been this morning, I asked you at the beginning uh, to consider in your prayer, what is your relationship to God's word? And more specifically, what is the condition of your relationship with God's word? And as we think about who Jesus is as the word of God... We, number one, need to be in a right relationship with him, and we can't be in a right relationship with him until we've confessed our sin and said, Jesus, I believe I'm a sinner. I believe you died in my place, and I ask you to forgive me and give me eternal life. That's the starting point for being in a right relationship with God's word. But after that moment, the question then becomes, what is your relationship to the written word? You see, the written word contains the testimony of the living word, And although it is possible to know the Word of God and not know who Jesus is, as in the case of Satan when he was tempting them, it is possible to know the Word of God and not know Jesus personally, but it is impossible to know Jesus personally without knowing the Word of God. Because it is in the Word of God that reveals to us who Jesus is. That's why Romans 10.17 says, Faith comes by? And hearing by what? The Word of God. You can't come to Jesus without hearing the Bible. You can't be saved without hearing the message of the Bible. 
And we can't grow in our relationship with him apart from the word of God. I talk to so many men who really don't like to read. And when you ask them how they're doing in their spiritual walk, they say, well, you know what? I really don't like to read, and so I don't read the Bible much. And I always try to encourage them, get the Bible on CD or download an app so that you can hear the Word of God. If you, can't, if you don't like reading, at least hear the Word of God as it's being read. Because the Word of God is that which will help you to grow to become more like Jesus. And we can't grow apart from the Word. So when I ask you this question this morning, what is your relationship to God's Word? It has huge ramifications as to whether or not you are being conformed into the image of Jesus. Because you can't become more like Jesus apart from the Word. It's impossible. So the questions that we need to ask ourselves is, when do you study God's Word? Jesus studied it. When do you study it? Is it a part of your daily routine? Is it a part of the very fabric of who you are? And if you, can't, if you don't like to read or if you can't read, you can hear the word being read to you. Do you know in this day and age, we have more access to the word of God than any other generation in history? We have more access to the Word of God than any other generation in history. And yet, when you look at the polls, the polls still say that the average Christian in America is biblically illiterate. They don't know what the Bible's about. How can that be? The Word of God is all around us. When do we sit down and study God's Word? Of course, the second question is following the outline of Jesus. How well do you discern God's Word? You know, there's a story about the guy that was doing Bible study, and he didn't really know what to study. And so he opened up his Bible and put it in front of a fan and let the fan blow the pages. And then he was just going to point to a verse that the, the fan blew the pages to. And when he did, he says, Lord, show me what you want me to do. And the pages blew, and he went like this, and it says, and Judas went out and hung himself. <laughs> he says, Lord, you know, just show me, is this, you know... And then the pages blew again, and it says, go thou and do likewise. So he was really confused in his Bible study. Hey, do we have the ability to discern God's Word, to be able to discern that which is right and that which is almost right? And we can't do that unless we're studying the Word. And the last question this morning, where do you apply God's Word in your life? See, God's Word has application for every area of your life, from your finances to your family to your entertainment to your workplace there is no aspect of your life that is free from the authority of God's Word. Oh, if we're going to be more like Jesus, we need to study His Word. If we're going to be more like Jesus, we need to be able to discern His Word. And if we're going to be more like Jesus, we need to be able to apply His Word. These are some character qualities of a Christ follower that we are endeavoring to develop in our people at Southgate. Everything that we do in our equipping hour, everything that we do in our morning service, everything that we do in Awana and Sunday school with the kids and in youth, and the youth are away this weekend at fall retreat, everything that we do that is focused on the Word of God is trying to equip us to study, discern, and apply. We can't be Christ followers if we're not doing this. It is so important for us so that we become more like Jesus. So we're going to have a moment. I'm going to pray, and we're going to close our service. And then we have an opportunity to go to more classrooms so that we can learn how to do this. And some of us are going to get up and leave, and we're not going to go to a class. Because uh, we don't feel like it's relevant to us. We don't think like it's important to us. Some of you are going to get up and you're going to go because you, that's what you always do. You go. How are you becoming more like Jesus? The church has a plan to move you forward to become more like Jesus. But you've got to make yourself available to the plan so that we can help you become more like him. There is nothing more important in your life than that. John said, these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. 
Oh, it's my prayer that all of you who are here would know Jesus, that you would know the Word, the living Word, the eternal Word, and that His Word would have so much relevance in your life that when people look at you, they say, He looks just like Jesus. She looks just like Jesus. Will you pray with me? Father, we thank you for this day and for this time that we can be together. And Lord, as this series is titled, More Like Jesus, it is my prayer that all of us, as a result of our time together, every time that we're together, is that we would become more like Jesus. Father, there may be some people who are with us today that don't know Christ. They know religion and they know church. And they might even know the Bible, but they don't know Jesus. I pray that you would open their eyes to their sin, open their eyes to what Jesus did for them, and I pray that you would gloriously save them this morning. And Father, for those who are here who say that they're Christ followers, I pray that you would help them to become more like Jesus. Help them to see that they need to study the Word, discern the Word, and apply the Word so that they can become more like Him. And as a church, as we think about our future and as we think about strategic planning, Help us to remember that everything that we're doing is designed to make us more like Jesus. And help us, Lord, to move forward in a way that people would see Jesus developing in us. I pray this in his name for his glory. Amen.